Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon hits theaters this weekend, and I've got my thoughts right now. This video is brought to you by Babbel. Go to babbel.com slash Dan to get up to 55% off your subscription and stay tuned after this review for more info. Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle here with my review of the long-awaited next film from Martin Scorsese, Killers of the Flower Moon. This is his first film since 2019's The Irishman, largely because of the production shutdowns due to COVID-19. And like The Irishman, this movie is also very long, and it was done in league with a streaming service, although luckily, this one is actually getting a proper theatrical release before people will just start watching it on the toilet at home. Killers of the Flower Moon takes place in Oklahoma shortly following World War I as the indigenous Osage people are experiencing a financial renaissance because of oil that's found on their land. Ernest Burkhart, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, comes to Oklahoma and soon falls under the spell of his uncle, William King Hale, played by Robert De Niro. King, as he's called, is outwardly the Osage people's greatest friend, but is actually plotting to steal their land and their oil money, including through marriage. Most of the movie is a game of cat and mouse, as the Osage begin to suspect foul play, as bodies begin to pile up and accidents begin to increase, while Ernest is torn between loyalty to his uncle uncle and to his wife. Shomikasi. That's how you are. I don't know what you said, but it must have been Indian for handsome devil. <laughs> <laughs> There are very few directors out there that could convince a studio, or in this case, two studios, Apple and Paramount, to shell out over $200 million in order to make a three-plus-hour historical drama. Really, it's very unlikely that this movie is going to be financially successful in a traditional sense. Martin Scorsese is just one of those directors that studios want to be in business with because of the prestige attached and because they want this movie on their resume. It has been 50 years since Scorsese's breakout film Mean Streets and he's still here, still making movies with Robert De Niro and still exploring the morality of mankind, the price of sin, and the corrupting influence of money and power. I think a lot of times because those themes are present in the mafia stories that Scorsese has told that people say, well, he only makes one kind of movie. He just makes mobster movies. That's not true. He does make movies that explore similar themes, but they're not all mobster movies and even even though this one you could say is about some sort of crime that goes on, it's also not a mafia movie. Not many directors Martin Scorsese's age are still working or still working regularly or still working at such a high level. Of course, I want him to be able to go on directing for many, many more years, but there is always the fear that every movie that Scorsese does could be the last Martin Scorsese picture. And that's a lot of expectation to heap onto every single movie, probably an unfair amount of expectation. But when you've been doing it as long as Scorsese's been doing it, of course your next movie is always going to be anticipated. Killers of the Flower Moon has been coasting on a wave of critical acclaim since its premiere at the Cannes Film Festival this past summer. I don't generally mind long movies, and this is a very long movie, about three and a half hours long, as long as the movie needs to be that long. Lawrence of Arabia, for example, is longer than this film, and it feels like it needs to be exactly the length that it is. And I will say that while I did enjoy Killers of the Flower Moon, I suspect that somewhere inside this three and a half hour good film is a three hour great film. Even though there is prestige attached to the movie, the movie business is still a business. And I think that one of the concessions that was made in order to get Killers of the Flower Moon produced and in theaters was to make it a star-driven movie. You can hang it on the names of Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro. And these are the two stars that they're putting front and center in the campaign for the film and that the movie largely puts front and center as well. They are unquestionably the drivers of the plot in the film, but forcing the movie to be centered on mainly these two characters often makes it feel like there are more interesting things going on on the fringe of what we're seeing, particularly when Jesse Plemons' FBI agent shows up to start investigating all of these mysterious deaths. The FBI in the third act particularly takes a bit of a backseat to De Niro and DiCaprio when it seems like maybe they should be the forefront and the investigation should be the forefront. And I think it's just the fact that you have these two stars and you want to put them in a bunch of the movie. You told them to do it in the front of the head and why did you do it in the 
back of the head. Uh, it's so simple. The front is the front, the back is the back. Man, he has to make it look like he done himself. It just looks like murder. It's not supposed to be that way. It does feel like the movie shouldn't be anchored to the two of them quite as much, and that's really only underscored by the performance from Lily Gladstone as Molly, who's an indigenous Osage woman who ends up becoming Leonardo DiCaprio's character's wife. Molly finds her family dying one by one and begins to wonder just how supportive her new family by marriage actually is, and Lily Gladstone is the beating heart of this movie. She drives it with her rage, her anger, her grief, and and potentially her misplaced faith, the Osage perspective is critical for this story to be told. And I think that there's a little bit less of that perspective in this film than there should be. But without Lily Gladstone's performance and the emotion that she's able to convey in that performance, I think the movie would feel even more lacking when it comes to the Osage perspective. She really, really is a standout in this movie. She is an awards contender. I think that she's going to be an awards front runner all the way through this upcoming season. And I wouldn't be surprised if she walks away with some of the major awards. And really, when you think about it, it takes a lot to be what I think is the standout performance or at least standout performance 1A in a movie that you share most of your screen time with Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro. That's just how good Lily Gladstone is. But DiCaprio and De Niro are also very good in this movie as well. I did get a bit more of a been there, done that feel from DiCaprio in this movie. And it's not that his performance was bad. He just has the burden of having done a few excellent performances in his career that I think are somewhat similar to this one with the accent work and everything else. So it's not a case of, oh, Leo wasn't very good in this movie or even disappointing. He was just the one actor in this ensemble of actors that I thought was doing things that I had seen him do well in other movies before. Robert De Niro, for me, is the Scorsese leading man who really stands out here. I think his performance is a return to form, the likes of which we haven't seen since the 1990s, a chilling portrayal of a man who will reach out to embrace you just so he can stab you in the back. If he ends up getting pushed as a Best Supporting Actor nominee this year, then I think it's going to be a real scrap between him and Robert Downey Jr. from Oppenheimer and some other nominees that may pop up, and I honestly don't know right now who I would vote for, but this is one of the best De Niro performances I've seen in a very long time. And it's just a reminder for people that perhaps grew up in De Niro's comedy era, just how good of a dramatic actor he really is. Scorsese, of course, has also assembled a talented cast of artists behind the camera to help execute this film. Oscar-winning screenwriter Eric Roth co-wrote the screenplay along with Martin Scorsese. It's his first writing credit since Silence back in 2016. The cinematography is from Rodrigo Prieto, who also shot Barbie. He's having quite a year. The editing, of course, is from Scorsese's legendary and essential picture cutter, Thelma Schoonmaker. And the original score comes from Robbie Robertson, the former member of the band called Called, well, the band, and also a frequent Scorsese collaborator when it comes to movie music. Sadly, this is Robertson's last score because he passed away back in August. All of these elements combine to make a strong film that lacks just enough focus, in my opinion, to keep it from greatness. When we're in Molly's shoes, when we see that she is in a town that's increasingly being surrounded by wolves and she doesn't know who to trust, the film is at its most harrowing. I think a combination of cutting some of the material that's currently in the film and perhaps restructuring the script to give us a little bit more of that Molly perspective and the perspective from the Osage people, as well as an enhanced role in and a bit more of a look into the FBI investigation would have made this story feel a bit more complete. Instead, at times, it feels a little too confined, locked into a sometimes repetitive series of events as De Niro schemes and DiCaprio wavers between who he's going to be loyal to. There's also an interesting choice that's made when it's time to resolve everything that I think is going to be very polarizing with audiences. I think it'll be discussed in the same way that that rat across the balcony is discussed in The Departed. Some people will be in favor of it, and some people not so much. While Killers of the Flower Moon does feel its length, it's also time that I think is well spent. And on my personal scale, it's solidly in the it's good category. It may well end up on my list of favorite films this year, although it won't be at the top. I think there's an expectation when you have a great director involved in a film that every film from that director is going to be great. And really, if you go back and watch the filmographies of even the best directors ever, not every single movie is great, but there is great 
greatness present in almost every single movie. There is greatness present with Killers of the Flower Moon in the performances, on the technical side, in several individual scenes. And even if I don't think that the movie itself as a whole is great and merely just quite good, it only underscores how lucky we are that we still have a filmmaker like Martin Scorsese making movies today. So those are my thoughts on Killers of the Flower Moon. What do you think? Are you blocking off about half a day to go see it this weekend? Let me know down in the comments below. And before we go, I want to thank the sponsor for this review, Babbel. If you look at trending searches over time, you'll see that interest in learning a new language is only growing as the years go by. And if you look at seasonal data, interest often spikes in the fall because summer's over, it's getting dark earlier, and it's the perfect time to pick up a new skill like learning a new language. With Babbel, you can start speaking a new language in just three weeks, just in time to impress your relatives for the holidays. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are designed by over 150 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks, and Babbel is designed by real people for real conversations. The lessons I've done on Babbel are easy to understand as you progress naturally. Plus, when you get an answer right, you hear this. Trust me, you'll learn to love that sound. With over 10 million subscriptions sold, Babbel is real language learning for real conversations, and their advanced speech recognition is like having your own personal language coach to help improve your pronunciation to get you prepped and confident for real-world conversations. With Babbel, you can learn everything you need from vocabulary words to culture, and all it takes is 10 minutes a day. Here's a special limited-time deal for our viewers and listeners to get you started right now. Get 55 percent off your Babbel subscription, but only for people that watch and listen to the show at babbel.com slash Dan. Get 55% off at babbel.com slash Dan, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash Dan. Rules and restrictions may apply. Thanks to Babbel for sponsoring this review, and thank you for watching it. Be sure to stay tuned right here on the channel for more movie news, reviews, box office, and more. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.